Awesome. It's top of the hour. Let's get rolling. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Fink, and I am the founder and CEO here at UVT. Joining me today is our Vice President of Projects, Mr. Matt Rybar. Matt, go ahead and say hello to everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Awesome. Matt is up uh, in Michigan, where uh, we'll be tuning in live to a live demo here shortly that Matt will be conducting. But appreciate everybody being here. Um, like I was saying earlier, this is our first time using this like level or version of Zoom. So I apologize in advance for any flubs. Uh, this will be recorded so we can post it online and Matt and Adam and my whole team and you guys can make fun of me uh, later. I do see we've got quite a few folks registered from agencies, so we will be respectful of your time. I thank you very much for being here. Um, so as you guys know, this morning, the DJI Doc 2 has launched. Um, that's why we're here. So like I said, my name is Chris. I'm the founder and CEO here at UVT. Uh, started the company in 2014, and joining me is Mr. Matt Rybar. Um, your questions are literally what guides this. I could talk about this to the wall, and I do usually do that all day long. I was actually talking to myself in the backstage of Zoom for a few minutes earlier. Uh, those early uh, early joiners got to witness or lack thereof that. So ask questions. The Q&A window is open. Uh, we will do our best to answer these live during the webinar. Um, and you can also find us online at UBTUS anywhere. I would check out YouTube because that's where the recording of this will be posted. You should also get an email when this is over. Uh, this is going to be super quick. I promise I hate talking about myself and other things. So this is going to be super quick. Uh, UBT, we were founded in 2014. I founded the company in Orlando and uh, quickly realized that the service world was not for me. Much respect to any service providers out there. Uh, it was just, it's a lot of work, man. You drive around, you set up, you fly, you load back up and you go to the next one. And so I quickly, real, quickly realized there wasn't much support or resources out there for folks in the field. And uh, our customers are now nationwide, thousands of agencies, and our customers are literally America's frontline workers, uh, utility workers, public safety, law enforcement, et cetera. And so we are here to serve. Uh, we serve you through uh, some of the nerdiest uh, information that you would uh, that you would ever see. So that's, uh, that's why we're here. Where are we? Uh, everywhere. Basically, uh, yes, this map is overwhelming. Yes, a lot of beautiful, talented faces on here, but we do have a presence in 13 states as of this year uh, that may have grown to 14 since this slide was actually set up. Uh, but we operate two brick and mortar locations. Our HQ, which is where I am, uh, is here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, northwest corner, best corner of the state. And then we also operate a demonstration site up in Fenton, Michigan, which is where Matt is located up there in the, in the great white north. Our HQ, as I said, is here in the Northwest Arkansas region. Uh, the cool part about this location in the country is that we can reach each coast uh, within just a couple of days from a shipping perspective. We also leverage Walmart, a little small little startup named Walmart that you guys may have heard of. Their headquarters is 15 minutes north of here. So we leverage that supply chain along with JB Hunt, Walmart, Tyson, and all of those to just better serve our customers. The more exciting location, in my personal opinion, is the demo site up in Michigan. That's where we now have a 100-foot tower on which we've installed some BD loss equipment, such as UAV Onyx's Cassia G, an ADS, ADS-B receiver, weather stations. we got a dedicated fiber backbone. I happen to be an RT guy, so it's pretty stellar. Um, and then some of our capabilities up there, we do already have a DJI Doc 1, which I, I promised we're going to get to the docs. This is just, you know, uh, the, the marketing team made me do this. Adam's going to be slacking me about that here in a second because he actually did not. We have a Doc 1 there with an M30T. And uh, in just a couple of days, we're going to have our, our Doc 2s, which just arrived. Uh, so we do have those, as well as a Hextronics Universal within an AFI USA for those of you that might be subject to NDAA or, um, you know, blue restrictions. We do have an option for that as well. Happy to talk about any of those. And then, as I mentioned, we have some BB loss equipment with some radars and other cool things going online. We focus on pretty much the biggest industries out there, public safety, energy, utilities, and commercial security. A lot of really cool uh, similarities between public safety and commercial security, especially as it pertains to dock deployments. Um, one of the, the dock that we may be using today may or not be uh, may or may not be installed at, at a location just like that. And then real quick, I'll go over some, some key things. This isn't a sales pitch. You can, you can you know, be looking to other screen here, but I, I want to instill the importance of these services specifically for dock-related deployments. Anything you're doing in remote operations, it is not just an order a box, cut the tape, open it, charge it, and go. It's, it's literally not. Now, they may work out of the box, and the, and the DJI Doc 1 and DJI Doc 2 are literally the most off-the-shelf or COTS, COTS solution out there, they're still not going to work when you plug it in. You have to do some implementation. You have to do some testing, some updating, 
and really put a lot of thought into this. And so we do that for our customers initially through three ways, our pre-flight, our support, and our fleet. Uh, so pre-flight is just that. Every piece of equipment that comes to our warehouse gets opened, updated, tested to make sure no batteries are dead, nothing got damaged in shipping, you're not missing a propeller, because how bad would that be if you show up and you bought a quadcopter, but you got a tricopter because one of your motors is missing a prop? That has actually happened. So things, uh, crazier things have happened. So our ProLine pre-flight is just that. Our factory trained technicians will go through and handle all of that for you. This is free for all public safety and government agencies and, and the most large corporations, especially on, on large deployments, will do this for you anyway. ProLine support, it's an always on approach to support an omni-channel support structure. You can reach us through chat, phone, text, uh, all kinds of things. There are different levels so we do have premium, which is 24 seven. And then every sale comes with our, just sort of our basic level of pro line support, but it's, it's designed to be mission critical, technical and fleet support services, because there's a lot of fleet support things that aren't, Hey, I need to update my firmware. It's like, Hey, my batteries are getting old. What the heck do I do now? Or is this update safe? Whatever, whatever. So, and I see some names in the list that have called me at three in the morning, asking me if they can update while they're in the field. And my answer is always do not update in the field, please. Proline Fleet, the last one. Um, you know, this industry, we, this is our 10th year, for example. We, we got founded in 2014, and it's incredible to see the maturity and breadth of fleets out there, both from number of pilots, number of drones, but also the uh, the diversity among those fleets, especially now in this era that we're in where people are kind of branching out to different manufacturers or different types of technology. Um, so we offer a, a cohesive approach to ProLine Fleet. We primarily use air data, but we do have some other amazing software partners out there um, that we work with as well. So just kind of want to make the sort of paint the picture that this stuff is super important and even more important when we talk about remote operations, which is why we're here. Last thing I'll say, because I saw some government folks on there, we do hold two government contracts. Uh, we've got Sourcewell and TIPS. If you if those names mean anything to you, then immediately you know the value. If they don't, ask your procurement people about it. But this can really grease the skids for you guys out there um, and help you from having to gather as many pieces of paper and three quotes and just spending the days while you're in your patrol car or out in your utility truck trying to figure out how to buy the stuff that you need. DJI Doc 2. That's why we're here. I'm done talking about us. Let's talk about some cool technology. So as you guys know, probably the DJI Doc 1 has been out for a bit now. So there's the dock and the dock two, right? So when people say the DJI dock, if you don't hear a number on that or you hear dock one, that has an M30 or an M30T in it. To be honest with you, I don't know anybody flying the M30. The M30T is where it's at because you need that thermal. Um, the dock two actually changes that, which we'll get into here in a second. So the DJI dock, it's over 200 pounds. It's relatively large. However, it does have, as I said, a Matrice 30 series aircraft in it, which brings with it some additional imaging capabilities and things like that, redundant power faster charge times, which you'll see here. The things in red on this, you're welcome to screenshot this. This will be recorded, but you're welcome to screenshot this as well. Uh, I apologize, it's a little blurry. It's actually a screenshot of a, of a screenshot. So um, the stuff in red are the differences, right? So you can see that you've got a, a wider operating temperature range of the DJI Dock 1, whereas you have a lower power requirement with the Dock 2. You've also got a much, much smaller and lighter. I literally, about 20 minutes before I started this webinar, I was in our shop and I just picked up the dock too, and I'm not taking credit for strength. I picked it up and just put it on the workbench. Simple as that. The dock two, or sorry, the dock one, the Matrice 30 series, you would not be able to do that with. Still a, a very deployable system, maybe better for DFR in some respects. There's some, there's some controversy out there, um, but just different systems for different uses. So I would say that on this, uh, environmental conditions are, are a big consideration, but also camera specs, which we'll get into next. So along with the dock two today, DJI officially announced, even though it's been all over the web for months and months, the Matrice 3D series. Now, the Matrice 3D series is technically made up of an M3D and an M3TD, okay? So many M3, so many spec. So within the Matrice 3D series, there's the Matrice 3D, which has no thermal camera, but it does have a micro four thirds uh, wide camera and then a telephoto lens. Then there's the M3TD, and that's going to be our primary focal point with this specifically uh, because we are talking DFR, and it's also the drone that we're going to be demoing um, through the uh, live demo here in just a little bit. See some questions coming in. Thank you guys very much. We will do our best to answer those. Keep them coming. Ask, ask, fire away, or just give me feedback because I think chat, I somehow managed to disable chat. Tell me I'm doing a terrible job in there, please. Um, 
So these are the breakdowns. So you've got that sort of at the, no offense to the Mavic flyers, but you have the M3T, Mavic 3 Thermal, okay? It's not a Matrice series aircraft, but it is a Mavic 3 Thermal, relatively the same payload that you're going to find uh, on the M3TD, just some, some minor changes to the, the wide angle lens, which you can actually see there on the spec sheet. That's the Mavic 3 Thermal. Then sort of now with this new Matrice lineup, step above that in a way is going to be the Mavic, nope, it's going to be the Matrice 3TD. So it's the Matrice 3 Thermal D, right? So the T means thermal. So those are your kind of two levels. And then above those, you've got the Matrice 30T series, which we've, or the Matrice 30 series or the Matrice 30T that we've come to know forever. So you've got Matrice 30, Matrice 3D series, and M3T. And in fact, I have, this is a, I forgot I even had this behind me. This is the 3TD. Uh, so not by any means a comprehensive view, which, you know, we'll get you guys demos in the field, but as you can see, kind of a funky thing, legs do not fold. So please don't try. Um, but kind of a cool thing, rear load battery, our batteries haven't come in yet, but you know, as does DJI life, RTK on the top. So this is the Matrice 3 TD. And you know that because of the thermal camera, I think I'm pointing at the right thing, but you can see that right there. So that's the lineup, super confusing. I wish, you know, they had some other letters and numbers in there, but that's why we're here. We can sort through this stuff for you. So real quick, we're going to go into some key considerations when deploying remote operations, and then we will be getting to the live flight demo, I promise you. Uh, thank you for the questions, guys. Appreciate that coming. So key considerations, remote operations or unattended operations, as DJI called it their launch video, it is literally the new frontier in our industry, uh, and it comes with its own set of unique challenges and requirements. And for that, and because Matt runs our remote operations division, I will be turning over the bulk of the presentation to Matt. And Matt, I will be your uh, I'll be your slide master. Okay, so you can take that take that over. Uh, I'm sure I'll be popping in randomly with uh, useless input. I love it. You make such a slide such a great slide clicker. As we've talked to a lot of you during uh, the Doc One deployment days, uh, there's some really large key considerations that go into uh, making your making sure you're successful. And DJI's rolled out a lot of those tools now to allow us to conduct uh, pre-site surveys uh, with a Mavic 3 Enterprise, with an M30T and other aircraft. Uh, but there are quite a few factors that go into making sure when that dock lands uh, at your facility and is getting installed that you have operational success. And uh, let me tell you that uh, our, our ability to help you navigate that process comes from some pretty big pain points on, on early dock installs and um, potential issues on site. So we bring up a pretty large depth of uh, knowledge as we bring you these points. But um, Chris has on the slide here, location, connectivity, location, maybe more connectivity after the fact. We're trying to emphasize that location and connectivity are the two biggest hurdles that you have to overcome uh, with deploying uh, any dock solution for remote operations. Um, first of all, coverage. Uh, so when you pick that location, you have to decide, Hey, where, what kind of coverage area are we going to get? And there's a number of different factors that we'll address uh, on the regulatory consideration side that drives into that. Um, but typical ranges of, of the different dock platforms are going to drastically vary uh, depending on different uh, environments. And so just to give you a, a wide uh, number for a transmission range or an aircraft range is unfortunately doesn't really do it justice to what the operational range truly is of these dock platforms. And so we'll be diving into that a little bit more too. Power, having reliable, dedicated power is incredibly important. Uh, the docking systems obviously require that uh, for flight, for takeoff. Uh, DJI has some redundancy built into their docks with uh, UPS systems on board to allow that dock to open, to still communicate with the network and, and take that aircraft back uh, into the docking station, close it up. Uh, if you do have a power loss in some situation. Uh, however, having that reliable, dedicated power is, is very important. Uh, one quick example, I may have uh, had a little drive this morning down to uh, fix a power situation that we had on the dock uh, that we're going to be showing you this afternoon. So having that stable power is just very important. Connectivity, uh, bandwidth is critical. Uh, we've put the dock one and dock two now on everything from a hardline fiber connection all the way to cellular to Starlink options. Uh, connectivity is very important in trying to understand how much data you're going to be pushing through that connection option. 
If you are in a security application and maybe you're not recording that video all the time, you're just running a live operation with a, with a pilot that's monitoring that screen, uh, it's going to be a lot easier and you're going to push a lot less data than say that inspection use case where you're collecting a lot of imagery on a consistent basis and going to ultimately have to push that back up to, through the cloud. Uh, so it's important to analyze how much data you're going to be using, what options might be out there, like I said, whether that be Starlink, whether that be uh, a cellular modem, or the best, most robust way is to hardline uh, fiber into the dock itself. Having the ability to remotely monitor that connection, even when uh, potentially your primary connection goes down, is also important when we start getting into completely remotely operated systems. And so we would always recommend having uh, a secondary backup for connectivity, uh, whether that be cellular or other options. As far as accessibility, the dock is dock two is much easier to move than dock one, uh, as well as installed just from a, a physical footprint and weight size. Uh, but there's still going to be some hard to reach locations where equipment's going to be needed to deploy that dock, say on a rooftop or other locations. Uh, so important on the accessibility side to make sure you're planning uh, in those pre-deployment uh, conversations. Next slide. One, uh, one funny note on the accessibility there is uh, there was a deployment that Matt did where he said, yeah, yeah, the dock's going up. It's great. And I said, I thought you said the crane couldn't make it out to And he goes, oh, yeah, it's fine. We have it on a tow strap hanging from a ladder truck. And I and I said, cool, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> Takes a village. But uh, so regulatory considerations, as we all know, if, if you're intimately involved in the remote operation space or the drone industry as a whole, the regulatory considerations are the toughest part of dock deployments. Uh, Thankfully, we have a lot of wonderful hardware manufacturers across the world that have been continuing to push the envelope with the technology. Uh, but the regulatory side um, is a bit of a hurdle at times to overcome. And that comes from the basis of the FAA uh, being very focused on the safety of the national airspace and being very strategic in those initiatives uh, to integrate this type of technology. And so important on the regulatory consideration side, uh, there are different regulations that allow different operators to do different things. And so we're fortunate to deal with a lot of public safety operators who fly under Part 91 and have less concerns uh, for certain aspects of the operation. Uh, however, beyond visual line of sight uh, is something that affects all of our uh, operators and customers. And so we can help you navigate that process uh, a little bit more specifically in your specific use case. But generally speaking, there's an, a few different ways to get beyond visual line of sight. Uh, the first would be critical infrastructure shielded. Uh, the FAA has accepted certain altitudes of operation uh, for remote operations, BV loss around critical infrastructure. When I use the term shielded, I mean uh, an altitude with uh, basically above uh, infrastructure that's on the site, whether that be transmission lines, whether that be distribution lines, uh, or any other infrastructure that's on the site, the FAA uh, is started to allow certain operations at certain altitudes above each of those uh, different uh, shielded infrastructure. For non-critical infrastructure, uh, a little bit wider spread use case, uh, there's also different altitudes, a little lower than critical infra infrastructure shielded. Uh, an example would be operating potentially at 50 feet above uh, the infrastructure within a half a mile radius. Uh, some of those concepts are being widely used to get those BV loss uh, waivers. When we start talking about general operations without shielding, there are a lot of different detect and alert devices out there that allow you to, uh, up to monitor an airspace uh, and then take an evasive move uh, with that aircraft uh, and get those wa those BV loss waivers uh, in those, those environments. And so a uh, number of different partners out there that are working on and have approved waivers using those DAA technologies. Operations over people is the last uh, big regulatory consideration. Um, if you're operating in part, under Part 91 as a governmental operator, uh, that uh, the onus goes on the agency to handle that aspect of the regulation. Uh, however, if you're operating under Part 107, uh, the regulations become a little stricter and the FAA is going to be looking for uh, a great use case to why and how you're going to operate over people in a safe, efficient manner. Uh, they've released the categories one through four aircraft and given some general guidelines about how to receive some of those waivers. But 
third party accessories like the AVSS parachute that also got released today uh, for the 3D and the 3DT. Uh, those types of accessories are going to be very important in obtaining uh, those different uh, waivers and category of aircraft uh, as you start to uh, deploy these. Quick sneak peek at some deployments we've had. There are a number of different platforms that you can set these uh, docks on and considerations to be had. Um, you'll see the, the dock two images we have there. Uh, more on uh, where those are deployed in the upcoming uh, weeks. We'll have, we'll have a deep dive uh, with some of those use, use cases and case studies. But um, you'll see on those deployments, we uh, had the dock two deployed on a uh, wooden platform, really just to get that dock off the ground. Uh, to make sure that uh, it wasn't uh, being uh, stormed on or rained on, water washing across maybe a rooftop or a parking lot. We just wanted to make sure that dock was up off the ground. So some sort of platform helps that. You'll see just below that are just some sneak peeks of some different dock one deployments at different customers that we have. Um, and so there's a lot of different uh, ways to uh, deploy that dock, whether it be on the rooftop, on a platform, uh, on the ground, anchored in different ways. And thankfully, DJI has released a number of different uh, methods and protocols to make those uh, acceptable dock deployments. Actually, something that I hadn't even considered. Matt sent me the picture in the bottom left of your screen there with the cinder blocks on the bottom. And I said, Matt, could we not have come up with something, you know, a little bit, I don't know, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing? And it turns out there's a lot of restrictions, speaking mostly specifically to government owned buildings, where you can't just drive a screw or something a little bit more robust through that that roof. You now you got to get an environmental study. You got to figure out what that's going to do to the actual platform uh, and all kinds of things. So I, I had no idea what went in to just planning that simple deployment. The ones there you can see with the wooden bases, those were designed to be temporary, right? So super easy to tear down and move. Um, but this is a perfect example of a consideration to have. And as you can see here, so you got the dock twos on the top. This is the Matrice 3 um, Matrice 3 TD flying. It's the newest drone that goes in the dock two, which you can see here. Um, so those two at the top are the dock two actually in, in use. These have been in use for a couple of months now, um, thanks to our partnership with DJI and some uh, amazing customers of ours. And then the bottom deployments here you can see are all dock one. So you can see it, it's hard to see with that perspective, but quite a bit of a taller uh, footprint, the, or I guess I should say taller profile, the footprint's relatively similar, uh, but of course a, a big weight difference. And even things as simple as the dock two, you know, only weighs about 70, 75 pounds, depending on what, you know, what all you got it strapped to. But if that's on top of a roof and that roof sees 50 mile per hour winds, that's going to completely change the considerations as compared to a 200 pound DJI dock one that might be up there in an environment that, you know, may, may have similar winds. So just a lot of things to consider in there. Um, portability is critical, of course, but it also comes with, with both some benefits and downsides, depending on how you choose to deploy these systems. The one who knows all the answers has not been asked all the questions. One of my favorite Confucius quotes. Um, so we do appreciate the questions coming in. I intended to, intendedly, intentionally uh, left the sort of nerdy techie stuff uh, relatively quick because I know the flight demo, which we're coming up on right now, um, is probably the biggest driver here. So I do encourage you guys to ask some, some technical questions. We can also go back and review um, some of those tech specs, but you know, fact is DJI puts out a lot of really good materials. And, um, and so I, you know, we'd hate to kind of bore you to death with, with uh, slides. I feel like we've already 23 minutes of PowerPoint is uh, probably the longest I'd, I'd want to do, but please do uh, feel free to ask the questions. It looks like we've already answered most of them. Um, and then uh, any, any that we don't get to, you're welcome to contact us and, and ask those too. So from here, we are going to tune tune in live to a uh, an undisclosed location in uh, Michigan. So uh, that is coming up. I am going to stop sharing my screen and uh, maybe let's see here. learning Zoom here. Hold on. There we go. I think we're I think we're good. Matt, you should be live. So we have tuned into a site in Michigan, and uh, and I'll turn it over to Matt again. Awesome, sounds great. So today we're going to be demoing in DJI Flight Hub Two. Uh, we have a number of software partners that we are very excited to roll out integrations uh, with Doc Two and, and showcase those different partnerships in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but as of right now, we're going to be demoing in Flight Hub Two. Uh, this location uh, is here in Michigan in the Metro Detroit area. 
like I said, uh, the current this current location we'll be talking more about uh, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but this use case is focused around security operations. So if you haven't seen Flight Hub 2 before, here's a quick sneak peek uh, in right here in Flight Hub 2. Uh, we'll start out and we'll see uh, our dock that we have deployed. If we had multiple docks at this location, uh, they would actually just stack up right below this in the project security operations uh, in Flight Hub 2. We'll navigate over here and look at a couple of the dock 2 specs. You'll see right away uh, that will catch most of your attention um, that right now the weather forecast uh, at this location is showing uh, unfit for flight. Uh, one of the uh, opportunities for uh, opportunities here in Flight Hub 2 is that that wind speed that it projects at that location is updated once an hour. Uh, so we've been watching uh, UAV forecast as well as a third party weather station on site. Uh, and can tell that we are still within the specs to deploy this aircraft at that site. You'll see the wind speed on site is actually the gauge that's right above the camera that we're viewing right now. So right now, uh, down there on the ground, we're seeing about six to eight mile an hour winds uh, on site, even though we're reporting uh, 43 mile an hour uh, from the uh, online weather source. So we will be able to uh, launch that, that dock at this point. Right now we are deployed on Starlink. Uh, overall, Starlink has been a wonderful stopgap to remote deployments, especially from a temporary situation. And so some of the video degradation that you'll see at times uh, is because of the heavy cloud cover we're seeing on Starlink today. Um, so that is a limitation of Starlink, uh, but we at this site, we do fail back over to cellular as well. So if we reach a certain threshold, we'll swing back to cellular uh, and, be, and be launching from there. Quick other overview of Flight Hub 2, you'll see on the left-hand side, we can pull up map annotations so we can mark different things while we're in flight uh, on the screen, as well as uh, carve out different areas. Uh, if we uh, potentially wanna have a buffer area, uh, where the aircraft is going to notify us of different things during that flight. We can put that on the map. You'll see just uh, right below it, we, right below the dock location, we actually have a large tower. So that tower is geofenced off. Just below that, you'll see a green line. And that green line is actually our operational area. So we've drawn out uh, the max area uh, that we'd like that aircraft to fly. And then through live uh, geofence sync, we will actually sync those geofences to the aircraft itself. So no longer are we just cloud connected with those geofences. We're actually pushing all of those geofence data right into the air, right into the aircraft itself. So if we have a lost link situation, it's still going to uh, recognize those geofences and avoid them uh, as it's returning to home back to the docking station. A couple of different ways to launch the dock two, just like dock one. You can uh, execute a pre-programmed flight path, uh, which we're not going to demonstrate today. Uh, the easiest way is we can just grab aircraft control by clicking this button, and then we will click the takeoff button, which will uh, pop up this screen to, to let us know which altitudes we're gonna take off to as well. Once we give it that takeoff uh, command, you should see the aircraft launching in about 45 seconds. One large improvement that DJI made from dock one into dock two is that RTK convergence is no longer required uh, on initial launch of the aircraft. And so uh, you'll see once the aircraft has its GPS location, it'll go through a quick systems check. It'll do a slight quick spin up of the props to make sure they're free and clear. And then it'll actually spin them up a second time for that, that complete, and, uh, complete launch sequence. One of the biggest hurdles that uh, people faced on dock one deployments uh, was exactly that RTK convergence. And so you'll see how quickly the aircraft's able to launch even without RTK, and then it can pick that RTK up while it's in flight. So the aircraft is up in the air. We'll go ahead and shut off the, we'll go ahead and shut off the uh, live view of the dock camera. And now we have a live view of the actual aircraft camera itself. We can take uh, control of that aircraft right from our computer here. We also can take payload control of our aircraft. So we'll see 
down here. We now have payload control, which we can manipulate the controls on that uh, camera. A third party payload operator, somebody else logged into this uh, DJI Flight Hub account could also uh, be the one that either controls the aircraft or uh, takes payload control. On the, uh, the dot camera itself, we have a couple different payloads uh, that Chris talked through before. We have the IR payload. Uh, in this security use case, uh, used extensively at for nighttime operations. We have the wide angle payload, which we looked at to start with. And then we do have the zoom payload as well. The zoom payload, uh, seven times optical. The rest will be digital past the optical. And we'll zoom right into the tracks there. And we'll jump back out to wide. Now you'll see uh, throughout this flight, uh, due to the weather conditions and location, uh, we actually have not picked up RTK yet. We're just operating uh, based off of the uh, standard GPS on the actual aircraft. Uh, that is not an issue uh, when we come back to land uh, due to the vision landing system uh, that is utilized as well. Uh, so we don't even need that RTK to come back and recover uh, after the flight either. We have the ability to uh, record in flight, record that video, uh, or take still photos. Uh, as soon as the dock, as soon as the aircraft returns to the docking station, it's then going to dump all of that data back onto uh, the dock and can then be pushed uh, to a AWS cloud bucket of your choosing or a third party device, or it can be retained in Flight Hub 2. Uh, and you can pull that data down right from the platform. So we will send the aircraft back home. As the aircraft starts to land, you'll see the camera on the aircraft points down to a 90 degree angle. Uh, this is to assist in that vision landing. The dock is opening right now. The dock does have a uh, double system, uh, two cameras on it. So it has one on the top of the weather station, then it has one on the docking platform itself. So as the dock opens, it's going to transition cameras uh, to the uh, interior camera. And then when it closes back up, it, it'll retransition back uh, to the uh, camera on top of the docking station. We will transition, we'll close back up. Aircraft is back in the dock. And you see as that docking station has closed, we'll then transition back to the camera on top of the station for situational awareness there. The DJI dock has uh, multiple protocols that it goes through pre-flight to uh, execute the pre-flight checklist, uh, which has been approved by the FAA uh, as a pre-flight checklist for this operation. The aircraft will remain powered on, you see here in the bottom, until all of the data has been dumped from the flight onto the docking station. And then that can be pushed uh, to whatever location of your choosing uh, after that. So the, the data workflow is it's going to transfer all of, the, uh, all of the data from the SD card on the aircraft to the docking station. If you are in a uh, situation where you're going, where you'd like to have this disconnected from uh, Flight Hub 2 or the DJI Cloud, then that data can be pushed to any location of your choosing uh, at that point. There are several different options out there utilizing a secure agent and on-prem um, if your security uh, requirements would require you to have the dock on a localized server and then you having control to pass that data to different locations. Chris, anything to chime in at this point? Well, you already kind of led into the data security piece. Anybody who knows me knows that I tend to get pretty involved in that. So the the one of the coolest parts related to data security, and this goes to the doc one or the doc two, there are just some caveats in there depending on which one. But the fact is you can run this completely disconnected from DGI entirely. There's no um, there's no module on board that you're required to connect to DJI. It doesn't have to talk or phone home. So you can connect this uh, either through Flight Hub to a third party AWS, an S3 bucket. Um, there's some other options coming online online soon, such as Microsoft Azure, things like that. Um, but you can also 
use a third party, right? So obviously this is a DJI demo and we're just using Flight Dub 2 because the Doc 2 is new, but we have got a lot, we have a lot of uh, awesome software providers, third party software providers that are already integrated with Doc 2 or will be integrated with Doc 2. Um, companies like Drone Harmony, Drone Deploy, Drone Sense, Flight Base, uh, Air Hub, all kinds of people that are out there. There's too many to name on here, um, but it's really important to, to kind of assess. And this kind of goes back to our initial discussion. Not only do you need to assess the site where you install it, but you also need to think about what are the deliverables, right? The ability to take a DJI Doc 2 that is relatively inexpensive and nobody has asked the pricing discussion yet. That's the one piece of information I don't have yet, uh, but it's going to be pretty inexpensive just based off of what I know, inexpensive comparative to like a DJI Doc 1. But the fact that you can deploy this dock in, in literally the middle of nowhere, start, this is running on Starlink at the moment. Um, there's actually a great question uh, on there that Matt's answering right now that we'll go over. But um, you can deploy these things anywhere. So now you have the, you have the capability and value of a drone, but it's anywhere that you need it to be that you can get connectivity and power to. So think about what that deliverable is. And I, I would imagine even for someone, I see some, some who I would consider big names on this webinar that are very, very experienced. Think about the power that you have right now and the amount of data that you're already managing and multiply that times 100, times 1,000, times 10, depending. You've got so much more data that you're working with. You have a whole new flight envelope, right? Now you can you can conduct these flights repeatedly. Uh, oh, somebody just asked a price question. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Nicholas. I appreciate that. We'll get back to you, buddy. Um, so you can you can deploy these things and you can run these tasks that were previously all manual, alle alleviating uh, once you have BB loss in place and other regulatory um, things in place, you can alleviate the human element entirely. So now the opportunities are endless. So all of that's to say, take what you're doing now, multiply it by however many times you think you might fly and really hone in on the right software solution. That might be Flight Hub 2. Uh, for those of you in North America, which this webinar was limited in North America on purpose so we can make sure we were answering uh, relevant questions. But you know, all of DJI runs in Amazon Web Services North America. So your data resides here in North America. So if that works for you, great. If it doesn't, that's okay. Find a third party, work with Matt and his team um, to find a third party app that's, that's gonna enable that for you. Speaking of some of that, uh, we did have some questions in here. Let's see. There was one that just came up a second ago. Uh, so Antoine asked a good question. You guys should be able to see these in there, but I just wanted to touch on it also virtually in case you don't have it on your screen. Antoine's asking if we can, if you or we or anybody can connect a third-party wind measuring um, piece of equipment to the dock. Uh, Antoine was mentioning that, and this is a great point, that the wind speed of the dock is certainly a consideration from a takeoff and landing perspective when you lower down at that altitude. But if you're going to run a mission at 200 feet, as we all know, those winds can change drastically. So Antoine was asking if you can install a wind measure, uh, you know, a wind gauge, weather station, whatever, at altitude or at a height on a tower or a crane. The answer is not with DJI flight up to currently, but some third party systems will do that. And, and some of the third party systems actually come with off the shelf integrations with systems like uh, Weatherflow or Tempest and things like that. So there's some options out there for it. We have a third party weather station at our site that doesn't go through flight up to, but it does go through some other software platform. So that's a great, that's a great consideration. You've got a dock that's on the ground or on the rooftop. The wind there is going to be way different than when you go up and actually start that mission at 200 feet. So definitely a, a huge consideration. Antoine also asked, asked another question, uh, connectivity. I'm a nerd, so it's one of my favorite topics. He asked if we had tried with a fiber connection versus Starlink um, for a, a remote or isolated location. I mean, the answer is fiber is always what we want. I want fiber at my house. I want fiber at my dock, right? That's, that's what you want. At the end of the day, this particular deployment relatively temporary. Uh, we'll be doing a, a, a hopefully a, a more hardened installation here where we can look at maybe installing some of that infrastructure. But absolutely, if you have fiber, even if you just have a, a coax or a copper connection that's coming in from a, an existing provider, um, definitely work with your networking teams, work with your ISPs and try to get that hard line connection. There is an RJ45 port on the dock, so it is uh, it does need that physical connection. So why not take that physical connection and put it through fiber? So absolutely. I can say personally, based off my experience and what I'm hearing from Matt, Starlink has worked incredibly well. Uh, we also work with people like Plum, uh, Plum Case and Cradle Point and some other providers for um, cell-based sort of backhauls or, or backup connections. So definitely, uh, definitely check into that. Uh, there's been a couple of questions on here, which Matt, thanks for going through and answering these. A couple of questions about does the dock lock after so nobody can open it? You can you can physically lock it, uh, but that would, of course, lock people out remotely. So the short answer is no. 
if somebody wants to come up and screw with it, they're going to come up and screw with it. That's why there's multiple cameras on board. Our typical deployment is going to involve uh, probably a third party external camera up on a pole. At our dock site, we have two cameras pointing on the dock at all times. One zoom, one's not. We have an AI detection camera that detects human movement um, and we can get alerts on all that. So there are going to be some considerations to, to make. I mean, you're installing a, I'm going to call it a sub $30,000 piece of equipment because it's going to be a lot lower than that, but that's right around what the dock one is. So I'm just going to say you've got a pretty piece of pretty expensive piece of equipment out there. Uh, and we all know people like to mess with people's things. So definitely a consideration. Rob asked the same question, basically any anti-theft measures. Short answer is no, um, but you can still lock the device if you have a reason to con to be concerned or, you know, if, depending on the facility, like in this particular instance, knowing who these folks are, if there was a an ongoing trend of that type of, of, of issue, they might lock it at certain times or or they may put a fence around it. In the ideal world, you would have you know some physical measures out there. Yeah, good question, Sean. So Sean asks, there's a timeline for delivery. You know, it's DJI. We don't even have pricing and yet it's been officially launched. Uh, so knowing what I know about your experience, it's probably not your first time dealing with that. I'm going to guess you know, depending on your dealer, depending on where they are in the allocation queue, uh, I would guess by the end of April, you should be able to get one. That's just my personal opinion based off what I hear. I would imagine our production units are going to be arriving in the next couple of weeks, I would hope. Uh, but again, we don't even have pricing yet. So what I can say is they've been making these things for a bit. Um, they've done incredibly well. Uh, globally. And so that's why they've now rolled out to North America, which is DJI's largest, DJI Enterprise's largest market. So um, hopefully within the next month or two is what I would say. But as we've mentioned, now's the time to start planning for that stuff, right? Figure out where you're going to install it. Um, think about your deliverables, look at some third-party software providers that are out there and uh, and really start planning it out. Because like I said, receiving it is one thing and then having everything you need in place to deploy it and actually get your money's worth out of it is a, a completely different uh, a completely different thing. So Great questions, though, Matt. That's all I. Uh, that's all I intend on taking over. I don't know if anything else to go over on that or not. That's all I have. Looks like we have one more question. Any chance the M3 TD would be available without the dock? Uh, to answer that question, I actually just before the webinar was talking to Chief Lighthizer about this. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you could put you could deploy the three TD outside of the dock. The one issue we uh, would like to raise, though, is just that landing gear um, on it. So you'll see the aircraft right behind Chris there. He'll so graciously bring it up. Uh, the aircraft is designed uh, to land in the cradle on the docking station itself. And the bottom of the aircraft is really not designed to uh, safely land on the ground. So if the surface was completely flat, uh, wind was low, you were coming in at a nice uh, even speed and you're going to land gently, um, yeah, absolutely, you could probably land on the ground. Uh, you start introducing any factors like winds, um, uh, the aircraft gets a little off uh, canter as it's coming down a little off level, um, really would be concerned about that aircraft landing and, and flipping uh, on its side. So UBT, we're probably not going to recommend uh, flying that aircraft outside the dock, uh, but we have a lot of public safety customers that uh, are going to try a lot of different things. And so I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm sure people will try it, but probably not recommended, at least initially. I'll, uh, I realized I was doing a, uh, a Vanna White while Matt was talking, and then I realized that Zoom doesn't show my camera unless I'm talking. So that was a good warm up. Uh, I'm going to do it again. So what Matt was talking about is just how how short and stubby. I mean, there's literally just a little rubber foot right here and then plastic. So there's really no, I mean, if you land this thing in tall grass, it's even lower than a Mavic because obviously the Mavic has that sort of, I'm going to use the term cantilever because I'm not an architect, but it has that sort of design that lifts that camera up off the ground. Um, so you would, you would have some challenges with that. To be perfectly honest with you, unless you were future planning and you wanted to add a dock to later, in my opinion, there's nothing about this that you probably couldn't get from a Mavic 3 thermal. Um, that's just my personal opinion. You, know, you can add RTK to the Mavic 3 thermal. You've got the expansion port of the Mavic 3 thermal. You've got all those capabilities. This one obviously is going to have some additional capabilities, maybe with some third-party attachments that the Mavic doesn't get. But um, I, I would certainly, as Matt said, we're going to caution folks against that. Uh, you can even see it's designed, you know, obviously it's flat at the bottom and then it kind of has that sort of cupped uh, design to kind of slide in. There are some some little you know bumpers and things here for that. Uh, some people you know there might be antenna systems and changes in there. 
the other part is too, and and I, I love our friends at DGI. They've been great to us over the last 10 years, but DGI is known, um, DGI is known for not for purposely not supporting certain things. I'm going to put it that way. Uh, DJ is very good at what they do, but um, at the end of the day, they're designing this for dock operations. Um, so I will just caution you against that uh, is, is what we would say. So uh, battery recharge time. Sean's asking what the battery recharge time is. You're at about 32 minutes, I believe, is what, uh, is what they said. 37. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Let me go back to, uh, let me pull this up here really quick. I'm going to go ahead and just throw the specs back up here. I had somebody text me uh, saying that I, the one time I didn't nerd out much. Uh, and something you'll see on the, on the percentage side is uh, 30 down to 30% is typically the usable range uh, before the aircraft's going to start that auto return to home sequence. There's not a lot of adjustment you can make on the dock uh, because there are some safety provisions built in for BV loss operations. Uh, that charge cycle is then going to charge you back up to 90% typically. Uh, you can, you can fine tune some settings, but mainly um, due to the sustained battery levels for long periods of time, typically going to be experiencing by most operators, uh, that's designed to bring you back up to 90%. So uh, that time range is going to be uh, basically to take you from that 15 to 20% back up to 90% uh, for operationally. Chris, you were right. I don't know where in the world I got 37 minutes from, but I was dead set on that, but it is 100% 32 minutes. Well, to be fair, Sean asked about 15 to 20 back to 100. So you might be onto something there because I'm going 20 to 90. So I'm going to give you credit where credit's due. Uh, but the advertised time from 20 to 90, it's funny too, because you'll notice like on the BS30 and the BS65 battery chargers, DJ is hyper-focused on that 90% mark, which is why you have that ready to fly mark in there. Um, so obviously, you know, in situ, if you will, um, an actual asset in use, you're going to go from 20 to 90 in about 32 minutes. It's You can also tell, I don't have the batteries yet, but you can see on the back, there's a massive, uh, there's a massive vent right there. So it's really cool to see DJI building in the cooling mechanisms to promote what I would call a crazy fast recharge time, given the size of that battery. The Dock One's got a slightly faster speed, going from ten to ten to ninety percent. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're we're down to brass tacks there. You also have a maximum working radius that's quite a bit higher on the Dock Two. Um, so I'll just leave these up here. I did, like I said, I had one one person ask me about that. Um, so yeah. Uh, we're pretty much wrapping up here, guys. I, I hate webinars. I feel like we're just talking to talk. I do enough of that every day. So we we sincerely appreciate everybody being here. I'm going to pull up the M3 uh, TD specifications over here on the left side of your screen as well. Uh, and just talk through those really quick. So you got 50 minutes of, uh, of flight time as compared to 45 with the Mavic and then 40 with the M30T. And then uh, it's interesting to see DJI breaking out the hover time too. I thought that was really interesting. People think, oh, well, as long as I'm hovering, I'm good. That's actually the least efficient mode of flight. Um, so you've got about 40 minute of hover time. You know, think about DFR overwatch operations where you're trying to keep an eye on a suspect or, you know, make sure he's not shooting at the back of the house, that type of thing. So um, pretty interesting specifications there. And of course the M3 TD, the Matrice 3 TD does have an IP54 rating, whereas the M30T has an IP55. Uh, but the dock two itself is IP55 rated. It's a slightly better rated than the aircraft because it's living out in the wild for uh, literally ever. So that's basically it, guys. We uh, we sincerely appreciate you guys being here. I'm going to just back her up to uh, where are we going here? I'm just going to go to the front site here. Uh, boom. Really appreciate everybody coming. Uh, this was our first one of these. At the end of this, you're going to get, I hope, if Zoom does what I told it to, you're going to get a little survey. It's, I think it's five questions. If you wouldn't mind taking a second to fill that out, this is, like I said, this is our first sort of more formal webinar event. We're trying to do more of these, but only if you guys see value in it. Um, and so if you guys don't see value in it, then please, uh, please tell us that. But there's some questions on there. Hope it all works out. And uh, I sincerely appreciate everybody coming. We will, uh, we'll see you in the next one. You can find us online at www. Nope. You can find us at www.uvt.us uh, or on all the platforms at UVTUS. Thank you guys so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Have a good day.